G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today I'm going to talk about oxidation by FTIR. It's a very standard used oil analysis test that you'll probably see on just about every oil analysis result that you get back. So understanding a few of the intricacies around the test is really important. Let's get into it. All right, so let's talk about oxidation by FTIR. What is FTIR? So FTIR stands for Fourier Transform Infrared and then Spectroscopy. And it's one of the kind of simplest and fastest ways that we can measure oxidation. There's a whole bunch of different oxidation tests. And we'll get into them. There's RULAR, there's RPVOT, also known as RBOT, right? Um, MPC can give you a measure of oxidation, TAN as well. But FTIR is kind of the standard one because it's very fast and, and we can replicate it many, many times. That's why it's used in most use oil analysis results. Now the Fourier transform bit is not really that important for our purposes. Fourier transform is a mathematical process that is used in uh, effectively signal processing, right? So it's taking wavelength data and turning it into something that we can interpret. The bit that is of interest for us is the infrared part because we need to understand how infrared light interacts with molecules so that we can understand how it measures oxidation. So if you'll remember from, oh, this is probably grade eight or grade nine physics, light exists on, uh, on a spectrum of different wavelengths and frequencies. And the reason we can convert between frequency and wavelength is because they're related to each other by the speed of the wave. And of course the speed of light is constant. Now, as you go between the frequencies, we categorize them into different types of photons or different types of waves according to their, their uh, energy, right? So very high energy waves are gamma waves, then you've got X-ray, then ultraviolet, infrared, microwave, and radio. And you'll probably remember from those classes back in, in uh, grade eight, that there's this very narrow band between ultraviolet and infrared, which corresponds to visible light. Now, the reason for the names ultraviolet and infrared is because violet is obviously one end of the rainbow, and so ultraviolet is above violet, and infrared is below the bottom of the rainbow, which is red, and therefore it is below the visible red. Now, the one that we're interested in for the purposes of FTIR is obviously infrared, so we want to understand how those wavelengths interact with molecules. Now, infrared exists roughly between the band of 700 nanometers and about two and a half million nanometers. That's the, that's the wave, wavelength that we're talking about. For our purpose, we're actually interested in an even narrower band than that because we don't use all of the different infrared wavelengths in this particular test. We're going between about sort of two and a half thousand nanometers uh, to 25,000 nanometers. And let's say I have um, a molecule. I'm going to use an arbitrary molecule here, which doesn't exist, right? CH2. But if I shoot uh, an infrared wave at it, one of those bonds may respond. And if it absorbs that infrared light, it's going to absorb that energy and it's going to vibrate in response, right? Now, whether it, it chooses to absorb that energy or not is dependent on a few things. It's it's the mass of the two uh, atoms involved in the bond. It's the type of bond. So here you'll have seen um, the single bond re responded to a different wavelength than the double bond did, as an example. Now, if I tried to fire the same wavelength that excited the single bond at the double bond, it is not going to respond to that, right? And that wavelength will just pass straight through. And we use these properties to help us um, quantify what kind of bonds are in the oil. So now let's introduce a detector and another molecule and see what kind of happens. So I'm gonna shoot a specific wavelength, right, at a single bond and it excites it and it vibrates. I'm gonna shoot that same wavelength as at a double bond. It doesn't respond and it hits the detector. At this another single bond, it excites it and then at a double bond, it doesn't. Right? So we have now detected, we, we shot out four photons, but we only detected two on the other side. Now you can imagine if I now change one of those bonds on the, the top molecule to a single bond, and I do the, exactly the same thing, 
I'm going to excite the first one. I'm not going to excite the second one, but I will excite the third and the fourth. So now, because the molecules have changed, the detector is going to show a different response, right? It only showed one photon being detected. So what we get out of this is a spectrum that shows wavelength versus what we would call absorbance. So we know that we have fired out infrared particles and we do that over a number of different wavelengths and we measure how many of them don't make it to the detector and we get some kind of curve, right? This is just a, a generic curve, but this is what the FTIR spectrum is. And that's something that you may have heard of. Now, how can we tr translate this into an oxidation value? Well, if you'll remember from our oxidation videos, we have a cycle of oxidation that produces some very specific compounds, right? So when we introduce free radicals and those radicals interact with oxygen, we get things like uh, peroxides and hyperoxides. And ultimately, the molecules that we get out of this tend to look like these four. So we get aldehydes, we get ketones, we get carboxylic acids, uh, we get alcohols. But one of the things that's kind of common to a lot of the oxidation byproducts is this carbon with a double bond to an oxygen, and that's called a carbonyl group. And you'll see that as an example on the carboxylic acid, you'll see it on an ester, and you'll see it on a ketone. So we can look for that specific bond and the amount of those bonds that are present in the bulk oil will give us an indication of the oxidation. So how do we then uh, translate that knowledge into a number? Well, there's a couple of different methods. Um, remember that we're looking for a carbon with a double bond oxygen. So that's going to respond to a very, very specific wavelength. So we might, what we might do is we might take those wavelengths, which are, um, you know, equivalent to the carbon double bond oxygen. It'll have a little bit of width to it. And we can measure the area under the curve. This is what's called the kind of the direct oxidation method. And by measuring the area under the curve, then we can get a value for oxidation, right? Uh, sometimes this is called uh, the JOAP method, um, which is, I think was developed by the military. So this is one method. And, and the thing that will um, make it obvious that a lab is using this JOAP method is if you test a new oil and the value is not zero, right? Now, the second way of doing it is if we were to uh, use FTIR to also test a sample of new oil, right? So maybe let's let's say, for example, you have a, a 320 centistote gear oil. You've measured the infrared spectrum of the new oil and that will stay constant, right? As long as the formulation doesn't change. And then you've also measured the spectrum of the used oil. And what you can do is you can pick a very specific wavelength, which is associated with that carbonyl group, and you can measure the difference between the peaks, right? So you measure the difference between the height of the, uh, what we would call the reference oil, that's the new oil, and the used oil. And that can give you an indication of how much has the oil oxidized. Now, going back to this, what is the kind of downside of using this method? Well, what I'm showing here is a carboxylic acid. And if we, you know, shoot a very specific wavelength at that carbon double bond oxygen, we're going to excite that molecule, right? And that same uh, infrared wavelength is going to pass through the rest of the molecule. However, if we swap out that hydrogen for an R functional group, what I now have is an ester. But the infrared doesn't, light doesn't know that. So it's going to, at the same wavelength, still excite that carbon double bond oxygen, and it's still going to pass through the rest. So to the infrared detector, an ester looks exactly like a carboxylic acid. So what that means is that esters kind of interfere with the oxidation result. And unfortunately, you know, esters are a very common co-base for a lot of synthetic oils, or are themselves the base stock for synthetic oils. You know, you'll see diesters in compressor oils, for example, or polyol esters in jet oils. So that's the one downside is that if we have esters in the formulation, it can often interfere with the FTIR oxidation result. All right, um, that's been a very quick primer on 
uh, Fourier transform uh, infrared spectroscopy. Um, I hope that that has been helpful to you. And if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. But otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.